This is the Magic Word Podcast.com. Hello, this is Scott Wells for the Magic Word Podcast.com. Today, I have someone coming to us from Las Vegas, and in fact, he has won many awards, uh, one of them, in fact, being there in Las Vegas, where he won the Golden Lion's Head Award that was presented by Siegfried and Roy some time ago. He's also two years, he said in, in a row, that he was uh, voted as the Stage Magician of the Year by the Academy of Magical Arts from the Magic Castle. He has done a, a lot of touring road shows in Canada uh, and New Zealand and South America. And he is uh, also uh, really gaining a lot of international uh, attention. And uh, he has also performed then in London Palladium, the Lido in Paris, uh, the Winter Garden in uh, Berlin, and uh, the Shinagawa Prince Hotel in Tokyo, Japan. I've not even visited there, let alone ever performed there. I think that's kind of pretty cool. Uh, no stranger, really, to the uh, City of Lights in Las Vegas. And he's appeared in many shows there, including uh, at the Riviera, at the Folie Bougere, at the Tropicana, and the Ultimate uh, Variety Show, V, and also at the uh, uh, Planet Hollywood's Hotel and Casino, uh, has been in several reviews and different shows, and perhaps you may have seen him a uh, time or two at uh, different magic conventions. And of course, from time to time that he is even seen out to sea whenever that he's performing for some luxury uh, cruise lines and everything. So please welcome my friend here today, Mr. Jason Byrne. Hey there, Jason. Hi, Scott. How are you? Fantastic. So glad to have you on here today. Uh, thanks for being available. I was uh, most of what you are really known for is doing a lot of uh, bird acts. And I just I, I wanted to jump in there real quickly, as we, you know, about birds and, and working with them. I remember working with um, uh, uh, Amos Lekovich uh, some time ago, and he had a lot of doves uh, that he would travel with. And when I work with him uh, here at the Magic Island, did you did, did you come here to Magic Island? Did you work here? with I was yeah. thinking that's where I think that we had first met back years and years ago, back in the eighties. It might have been even <laughs> so, so far back then. But I remember him uh, carrying his birds also. And at the time, did you have, were you still working with your large with the, uh, is it the macaw or parrots or? Um, when I worked magic Island there, I want to say that I just had the doves and I, I might've done, because there was repeated performances there, different weeks. You know, I did it a few times. Right. Uh, I'm not sure if I had the, the a duck with me when I went there or not. I may not have. Well, I I remember, of course, Valentino uh, performing with uh, ducks, and then he would split the ducks, and he was uh, you know quite popular uh, with the ladies <laughs> back back then at the uh, at the Magic Island then also, uh, and so uh, now when I said macaws, is it macaws or what kind of large birds actually is it? I've know? just got one parrot. It's a blue and gold macaw. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And, and pictures that I've seen of you also then uh, that have been some promo photos of uh, working with yellow doves. I, do, do you color the doves? Obviously they don't come that way. I mean, uh, and is that something that you still do or used to do or? Well, you know, it's funny that you ask uh, to, I often tell people when they say, how, how are you, you know, I've never seen yellow doves before. And I tell them uh, I feed them lots of lemonade. <laughs> but uh, I prefer the word tint over color. It's not a toxic uh, food coloring. I've been doing that for what seems like uh, 20 years. And I think based on, I mean, I've not wanted to be having to go through that process every three months. Uh, so it's been on my agenda to discontinue the yellow and just go with natural white doves. And, uh, you know, during this pandemic, I've not recolored them. Everybody's white. And, um, you know, I've got a secondary set of props that are white and not yellow. And so the game plan is to, to go white, you know, here on out. If Right. That's Did you find that the, uh, the tinted or the different colored doves maybe draw more attention? Was that kind of the idea of having, because as far as your backdrop, sometimes you might have a blue backdrop or a black one or something and, and white, of course, pops on that. Uh, but if you have yellow, that's something that's a little bit more attention getting. Was that kind of like a gimmick that you were thinking? 
It was a bit of a gimmick, yes. Uh, you know, there were fellas that were doing multicolored doves, different different uh, doves that were different colors. And, uh, and then there was the guys that were doing white. And uh, I thought it'd be different to just maybe do one solid color. And I chose yellow because it was like white, um, but with color, you know, it, uh, it did pop against the black and dark blues. Uh yeah, and uh, when and I know parrots also live for a lot longer than doves. Uh, so is that the same parrot that you've had for a long time? Yes, yes, she's uh, twenty-five years old plus. Twenty-five. Wow. What's her name? Uh, her name is Dee Dee. Yeah, I, I, I've named her after my great aunt. Oh, I was going to ask where the name Dee Dee had come from. Your great aunt. Uh, it was she, she. Someone. Did you live in Canada? You're from Canada originally. Originally from Windsor, Ontario, across from Detroit, yes. Yeah, because uh, early on in your career, you had worked with... Um, Greg Fruin. Greg Fruin. My mind just went completely blank over there. That's right. The two of you kind of had like a... wasn't Siegfried and Roy. I mean, you had a, your own kinds of personalities and things that you were doing. Uh, but uh, he's still up in uh, Canada, over there in Niagara, as yeah, I understand. He's up in Niagara Falls, doing very well. Right, right. Uh, you still see him from time to time? Uh, I popped in there once. I had a chance to, uh, I was visiting my sister in Toronto and I went up, uh, we, we went to Niagara Falls and we decided to go see Greg's show and he was a very gracious host and, uh, yeah, terrific job. Uh, now when you're working, um, uh, in, on cruise ships, do you have problems with doves? I've, I've often wondered about that. I've heard other guys when they're working ships, particularly with livestock, there are different uh, restrictions when you come into a country with uh, livestock that you have to quarantine them for a while and before that you can then go out and perform. And have and some people will send doves to different shit islands where they're going to be so that way they'll pick them up and they've been quarantined long enough for, you know, how, how you handle that on ships well uh, I did that in the beginning uh, in you know 2000 uh, early 2000 2001 2002 was was doing all of that hoop jumping if you will lots of paperwork um, and it just it, it wasn't much fun it was very expensive and uh, for the past 10 years I haven't I haven't used livestock on the ships at all at all yeah. hmm. okay yeah hmm. just to avoid all of that um paperwork and 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 having to care for them um the last uh, number of jobs that i've done on the ships is what they call fly on you know you go on there you do the shows and you get off the next day uh you're not you're not residing on the ship and so you would have to be relying on other staff or, or other performers to be uh, tending to those animals. I didn't want to have that, be putting that up upon other people, nor did the ships really want that stuff going on. You know, they don't want livestock on there. It's changed the, you know, the, 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 the business of traveling with animals is just, it's gotten so difficult that most that I know of, don't do it very much. But that was going to be my next question. I was curious as to whether that many people, the magicians, I should say, are actually performing on ships with uh, with livestock. I mean, it used to, I think Greg Gleason may have traveled with some um, uh, animals. Uh, I'm not sure, but I think he may have. And some um, other guys have had, you know, wild animals. And I'm sure that they've got uh, – restrictions against that kind of a thing uh, now they increase every year these re, these restrictions mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And, and so eventually you're probably not even going to have a uh, have a mouse or a gerbil that you can take <laughs> perform with i would think uh and so and, and that was kind of what was uh gonna uh, lead me over there to uh to talk about some of the cardistry types of things that uh that you do because as i understand it that uh, you do a uh, uh, a lot of uh, cardistry then now and kind of known for that kind of a thing or uh, as opposed to just sleight of hand but I mean just really fancy finger flicking is that something that you've really been working on uh, quite a bit here recently um yeah it's always uh, I've always got a deck of cards in the in the, in the van and uh, practicing uh, fan various sorts of fans and 
one-handed cuts and uh, that sort of stuff. And uh, I finally did get some carbon nip back up on the stage uh, back in 2017. It had been uh, over a dozen years since I'd done any uh, kind of sleight of hand uh, with, with, with playing cards up on the stage. Uh, so it was good to get back. Now, I really do love it. It's, it's obviously very difficult to do, especially when uh, the conditions, the temperatures aren't uh, favorable, you know. Uh, well, the humidity, I think it'd be horrible when you're trying to do some back palming or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so I've limited, uh, when I put together that routine, uh, I, I really tried to limit the, the difficulty level. Um, tried to just keep it short and keep it moving and, and have a nice variety of effects instead of simply all production. Uh, in fact, there is very little back palming um, uh, on that routine. Uh, but how, long, how long is your, uh, is your card routine? I want to say that was about three and a half minutes. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of once the stage portion is finished, it, it uh, flows into a close-up portion into the audience on a close-up table in the audience. I was uh, performing that uh, magnetic hand. Uh, you, you, you display yeah. a pile of cards, you put your hand on top, and it, it suspends to the, to the right. end of your hand, snap your fingers, they all drop. I, I was performing that. I mm -hmm. uh, really like that. Um, Were you using that with a, an iMag, I guess? I mean, an image magnifier, yes. large yes. screen? Yeah, a lot. Of, most of these ships have uh, video walls these days. Side projection, rear view projection. Have you found that it seems that the um, uh, the ships passengers enjoy uh, your close up or watching close up more or less than seeing actually a, a stage act? Well, I don't know. I was hired to do a stage show and I did pretty much did a stage show with, uh, you know, that was like the only close up trick in there. Yeah. Uh, that I was doing. I mean, I know several other guys, you know, Sean Farquhar and others who do large stage shows, but also will do things with an image magnifier and, and, uh, same thing. I mean, even at, uh, Rick Wilcox's show up in the, uh, uh, up in the Dells in Wisconsin that he does uh, close up and he's got a big screen and everything. So he brings an audience member and they kind of interact with them uh, on the stage and he can actually do some close up with them then as well. So uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it shows good variety, I think for a magician to be able to do close up as well as uh, stage you know, types of uh, stuff. Is there one that you prefer really over the other? I like it all. Yeah. <laughs> it's difficult to, uh, to, to pick one over the other. It's like apples and oranges, really. Um, yeah, I like I like all. all you ever tried dip, uh, dipping your foot into uh, the world of mentalism? Uh, I love mentalism. Uh, there's some amazing stuff going on out there these days. I saw a guy called Scott Sylvan out of Scotland do uh, one of these Zoom shows. It was, it was terrific. Uh, very innovative. Lots of uh, amazing projection he was using. Um, I really like what he was doing, but in that stage show that I did on the ship, uh, we, I did one, one prediction, you know, it was one, one prediction. I just really like to try to keep the variety instead of just a whole big chunk of men, mentalism, let's say, you know, right. uh, I was using, uh, I want to say Harry Anderson's mismatch card. I love that. Uh, mm -hmm. I really like it, you know? That plays well. I would think that play well because you're talking about a giant jumbo, not jumbo, but really a giant yeah, card. Giant, giant card. So very visual from you know thousand seat plus theaters that uh, they have you in here sometimes. Yeah, um, that really that's a good idea. A good suggestion for for large groups. That's a card trick that goes over for that size of a group. And I just love the visual force. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And when you're doing that on cruises, do you have t uh, three or four different acts that you uh, you do in a week, or are you going from ship to ship? Are you staying on the same ship, and then you do two or three? Every different every, every ship is different. They I all know. require different things from who they're hiring. Um, uh, for for several years, I did a ship where you were doing two big shows, and then 
a, a lounge show in the back uh, later that night. So three shows on one night. Um, I can't say that it's it's a lot of fun doing that many shows in a short period of time. Everything's rush, rush, rush. Uh, it's hard enough doing two big shows. <laughs> Uh, I, I would think so. And when you're saying big shows, are you doing large illusions aside from uh, the doves? Yes. Yeah. That, that's what I was going to say. And and how many assistants do you bring with you or do you uh, enlist the aid of the uh, dancers on the ship? Often you're using the help of, of people pre-existing on the ship and, and they're helping juggle their, their schedules to help with you. Um, you often just pay these uh, assistants on the side. Uh, mm -hmm. other, other engagements, you know, it was the cruise line was paying the salaries of the dancers. And part of the requirement was to be helping with this extra show that came on. So it's, it varies. It varies. Some, a lot of magicians bring, bring on their assistant. And I did, I did plenty of that too. Um, but, uh, I really like just going out there solo, working yeah. with working with their people, and uh, is it a little bit cheaper actually if you're using their help as opposed to bringing your own your own because you're I mean you're someone you're obviously that comfort level of an assistant right. that you it is. used it's cheaper. I think I think you're right. You know that it would be more expensive to be to be having someone travel alongside you just that travel expense alone. Uh, now you're talking uh, uh, an extra cabin, even if you, if you're not a couple. Right. So it makes total sense just to try to you know find some some onboard help. Well, and the onboard help I would think would be um, pretty darn good because uh, when I've been on ships and the people that I've uh, dealt with are dancers and singers who have been classically trained and they have uh, theater experience from college. They're usually college graduates and they're working on the ship for a year. And if they're not actually rehearsing for their own shows in the evenings uh, that they're calling bingo or they're being a server in the, in the bar or something. And so I think that they would jump at the chance of being able to help a magician because it kind of helps broaden their, uh, uh, their, uh, everything that they're going to be able to perform there on their resume, as well as uh, something that they really want to do. They want to, they want to dance and be on the stage rather than <laughs> calling bingo and shuffleboard and all that. Yeah. And it's not going to hurt making a couple extra bucks, right? <laughs> exactly. Right. That'd be something a little bit extra than too, that they're going to, uh, uh, and who knows, you know, well, I know a lot of guys have uh, met their wives on ships who have been dancers or singers and, <laughs> and that mm -hmm. kind of a thing, you know, then too. Um, but you've been in Vegas now for 25 years or so? Uh, close, close. Over 20 years, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll say 22 years here total, yep. And I, I know that you worked a, a, a variety of shows, but most of them have been there. Have you? I, I guess you've been over to Reno and wherever else. Uh, a little bit. Atlantic City some, yeah. I like it over there on the, on the East Coast, the boardwalk, the beach. Have you ever worked for an Indian casino? Yeah. Like, is it what, Foxwoods, I guess, out in Connecticut or someplace? I didn't do that one. I, I haven't done that one yet. I hope to. I hope to one day. Yeah. Okay. I just wondered if they were different in any way, and if so, how, as far as management goes, or their expectations and what they wanted you to do in the contracts, as opposed to a Vegas casino? Well, I do think that Vegas, uh, you know, has a certain kind of mentality. Uh, I'm not going to say that the, the standards are lower outside of town here, but when you think of Vegas, you know, you think of the wow factor. And, um, and I haven't done my own show here uh, other than, than a, a night at the uh, a local, a nearby library uh, working on some new material. Uh, it's highly competitive here. It's very expensive to be trying to do your own show. Uh, it's very much pay to play here and um, uh, stiff competition here. Uh, uh, my product, it really lends itself more for uh, something like the cruise market or resort somewhere. Uh, maybe one day we'll, we'll get a chance here, but uh, I'm, I'm quite happy just playing uh 
specialty act and, and someone else's show and having them worry about ticket sales and right filling seats and, and doing all of that uh, advertising uh, marketing uh I like to just walk in, do my thing, and then go home. Yeah, I think it'd be particularly difficult for someone to four-wall that because you have all of this other, all these other things you have to worry about and covering your nut and selling the seats and advertising and everything else. Even if you have some other people helping you to do that, that's going to be less money than is coming in for you uh, as far as gross profit goes. But um, I, I think you need to, uh, uh, you, you got that right. If you kind of work in, as a part of a variety show of something else where there's someone else is uh, actually putting the thing together and they are the ones who are trying to sell us each. You just do what you're best at, you know? Well, and what's really great about doing what I've been doing for the past 18 years is uh, practically coming and going as you please uh, with the understanding that you're not, you're not going to do another gig uh, full time. Um, but uh, anything that's kind of short time, um, I was uh, flying off uh, across the country, getting on the ships, do the show, come back and do the weekends here in town. It was just uh, terrific. Well, when you do those kinds of things, in other words, that uh, you, you, you do have a contract for a variety show, what kind of flexibility do you have to be able to go and do a ship or to go run off and to do a corporate uh, job or, or those kinds of things? Do you have to have someone to fill in for you? Uh, and then do you worry, oh, that guy might take my job or do they just do without you? Or how, how, well, what happens how here is the show's running seven days a week, so they do have an overflow of acts should people get hurt or injured or sick or have to, you know, emergency leave. Um, so there, there's there's plenty of acts to fill in, and they just you, you know pull from that roster. Um, uh, you know they have a couple of jugglers in this variety show. Uh, there's a hula hoop artist, roller skaters, uh, knife throwing, crossbow act, um, uh, comedy acts, gaucho act. You know. Well, it uh, I know on cruise ships, of course, that there are uh, comment cards that you live and die by, of course. Uh, do they have anything like that in a variety show? I know in a magic show, when you're four-walling it, it, you know, you would know immediately of whether the people are coming and putting butts in seats. But in a variety show, uh, if they're coming in to see you or that kind of a thing, <clears throat> would that be uh, – is that something that they – notify you I mean, as far as the producer and uh, do they get some sort of comment cards practice comment cards where i'm where i'm at you know i i've seldom seen that here in town okay i mean people are reacting online you know yelp yeah uh, trip advisor right exactly so that's that's where people are are getting getting information right Right. Are you constantly also working on um, uh, new material? I mean, uh, I guess you kind of keep your ear to the ground. You kind of hear what's new and, and magic. Uh, are you trying to keep on cutting edge or you kind of feel as if that, hey, I've got an act and I'm going <laughs> to do that till I die? No, I'm very much a big believer of new, of new material, developing new material. I'm always working on something. Often magic seems to be getting the back burner. But uh, because of everyday life and, and whatnot. But yeah, I'm always working on stuff. Uh, I think it's possible to keep up, have your, have your thumb on the pulse of what's really happening out there. There's just so much being put out, right. you know, so much material that's coming out on a daily basis. Uh, yeah. It really is. And in that case, are you looking at things that, uh, it, well, I was going to say interest you. I know there are a lot of close-up things that come out <laughs> literally daily, uh, but uh, I wouldn't think that there are a lot of new illusions that are coming out, new and original illusions, uh, and maybe not very many uh, stand-up routines or things that you might incorporate in your act. Uh, so uh, do you kind of sit and work with a, some uh, brain trusts and kind of come up with some different ideas for different illusions or are you kind of talking with some of the local builders and say, what have you got? What's new or what? Uh, a little bit, a little bit of every, uh, all of that. Um, but, uh, you know, trying to develop a new illusion is, is often very expensive, more expensive than buying something that's, you know, tried and true. Um, and there's always risk that that may not work out for whatever reason. 
Uh, I've, I've stuck with a lot of classics, big believer in the classics, um, uh, like plenty of that new stuff going on out there. I've always felt that Franz was a, Franz Arari was a, you know, an innovative illusion inventor and designer and, uh, Jim Steinmeier and Don Wayne, uh, you know, those pl lots, lots of people like that. Um, I've invested into some, some modern illusions. Uh, I can't say that I've really uh, invented anything myself. Uh, I've always tried to put my stamp on on whatever it is that I'm that I'm you know attempting to to put together and interested in performing. And when you're doing that, do you uh, do you uh, talk to your an assistant and say, "Hey, I, I've got an idea over here, and uh, I'd like to put you in this box or to have you do something"? I mean. The, how much of the creative process comes from the assistant's input is kind of where I'm going. Uh, yeah, I've gotten some very good uh, uh, input from, from some of the uh, assistants and dancers. Uh, but often I'm working with uh, uh, a, a director, you know, a choreographer. There'll be a game plan in advance. Um, I have some consultant type of friends that uh, I'm always trying to uh, get feedback from and uh, those who I trust. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, a great idea because uh, too many magicians, I believe, try to do it all. And particularly, as we talked about earlier, if you're four walling it, that you're having to worry about all these other things, quite literally worrying about putting butts in seats and trying to cover that nut and everything. And and where do you advertise? Where's the best place to put your money to, to get the best return, your ROI? And so, uh, yeah, you have a lot of things. So it's great that you uh, are doing it the right way where you're going to outside people uh, and that is producers and directors and having someone to actually look at the show and to give you advice to kind of make this uh, uh, a good, tight, entertaining show. Because if you're just looking at it through your own eyes, you might say, ah, that's great. But then it's really not because a lot of times we're not always honest with ourselves. I'm not saying you particularly, I'm just saying magicians right. in general, myself right. included. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, of trying to uh, come up with uh, with different ideas, I, I want to go back again just for a moment to uh, to doves uh, because that you've uh, been doing them for for so long, and I know that uh, people like David Oliver uh, who had been doing doves and he had problems with uh, I don't know what that was called, but he had dove dust in his lungs and basically had to have a lung transplant. And I know that uh, there are others who have had issues with that. It, it, do you keep your doves uh, where that you live with them? Do you have an outside coop or how do you, uh, how do you keep from developing uh, ailments related right. to well, doves? I, I am keeping uh, the doves. Uh, they're in the garage. Um, with a swamp cooler through the summer. Um, and then they pretty much reside throughout the year in the garage. Um, but I'm also taking those birds outside every day. Every day that's nice, they're coming outside. Uh, I've got these cages that are stacked upon uh, one another and they're on dollies so they can wheel out quickly uh, and there is a bigger outdoor coop that I can put some birds out there that have even got a little more space than, than their housing cages. How uh, many doves do you have right now? Uh, I would say less than, uh, they're very close to a dozen, I bet, I've got. Yeah. There's you try no, to keep about that same amount? I mean, I know that they're reproducing yeah, all the time. You, up having a, 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 you know, a few more and sometimes a few less. And when you're down a few, you, you're, you're on the hunt. And trying to find uh, some new young ones. Uh, hmm. So you don't breed your own? No, no, I'm not. I'm not breeding my own. That's a whole other game. <laughs> well, I wondered about that because when I had doves, that uh, my wife used to, she would say, do weekly abortions. She would take the eggs and just throw them against the fence, you know, because they're always laying eggs. And I don't know whether that they actually were fertile or not, but they, right. but they were laying eggs. And I guess I was just guessing that if we would have let them 
set on the eggs, they would have grown and we would have had some more doves. We didn't need more doves. And so that's why I was wondering, if it, is it that easy or do you have to actually uh, go out to it? Pretty easily and pretty quickly, but there's all sorts of, you know, issues that you encounter with dove breeding. You, you could end up with, uh, you know, baby birds dying, uh, crippled leg. Uh, you really want to have the right kind of nesting um, material and nest, shape of nest. Um, but there's no guarantee of, uh, you know, perfectly healthy young, young baby. There's always, there's always some small risk, but for the right. most part, those breeders, you know, I just play it safe, buy it from the breeder, buy it from a seller, try to get the young ones, you know, so you, so they're trainable, um, you know, hard, hard to train an old bird, new tricks. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, how long do you spend then actually with a, a dove to train it to come back to your perch or your finger or whatever? Yeah. yeah. Well, in the beginning, you're spending more time getting them accustomed to that routine than you are once they know that routine. Mm -hmm. um, and when I'm getting some new birds, I'm often practicing working with them for short periods, multiple times a day. That ends up going down to, you know, twice a day and then once a day, one session, you know. And those sessions are not long after once they know, once they are flying out and coming back, you you can do a session within, you know, 10 minutes. I remember years ago when Lance Burton had won the gold medal at the uh, IBM. And at that time, he was... Um, what was interesting uh, that he rehearsed in, in the theater of tossing the doves into the spotlight and letting them come back and perch on his uh, uh, street lamp, basically street light and sign. Uh, and uh, just was taking a lot of time in doing that because I'm sure that he had that down already and uh, had practiced at home and wherever else. But uh, when you're in a larger theater and they're, the birds are under lights, that's a different situation. Uh, and so in that case, I mean, do you take, and, and I remember Siegfried and Roy had a performance course at that point in their career, they had a place across the street that was a replica of their stage. So they could practice with their lions and tigers there without having to take them down to the actual casino. Uh, so my question is, how do you rehearse with your, your doves then uh, in real performing situations where they would be hit by spotlights. Cause I mean, just like us, when we're standing on the stage and you're blinded and you cannot see past the front row, I think would think doves be the same thing when you release them, particularly it's gone from dark to light. All of a sudden it's like, wow, where am I? Mm -hmm. uh, so how, how do you practice or rehearse with them and where do you go? Well, what I'm doing is when I'm getting a new bird, I'll, I'll start, getting it to fly to me with, you know, full light in the garage, just from the cage to me, and we'll get that pattern going. And then they, they just start flying out of the cage to, to, to feed out of your hand, you know? And so you're halfway there. Um, I do eventually uh, get some, I've got this sort of what I call dove training room in the garage. There's black curtains that form a, a, a space that's roughly eight feet wide by 12 feet long. There's a mini, miniature spot, so I can get them accustomed to some spot I, spotlight only lighting environment. And then I will be taking them in some different rooms with full light, you know, such as the living room or the family room, maybe down a hallway, and do, uh, do those sessions with, you know, full light TV and now they're ready to go into a bigger space, you know, mm -hmm. space, uh, try to find something where, where the birds aren't flying up in the rafters, you know, trying to get them down with poles or, or genie lifts or ladders. <laughs> uh, That's a horrible and thing. Then you're, you're getting into the, the performance venue and, you know, um, wait till they're hungry, you know, and then, um, get out, put them in your hand. Yeah. And, and they're bound to do whatever, you know, take off, go up, got to try to get them back down. But it's, it's really about repetition. Once they can get in that rhythm, you'll find that, you know, a lot of those birds, they, they do above 95%.
What was one of the worst uh, situations you've had where you've had a dove? You maybe rehearsed and before a show went in the rafters and the time was getting tight and you weren't able to get the dove back down before the show or had to go some other direction. Or have you got any stories like that? Well, I think that's always happened to one of these, uh, you know, dove performers. They're always waiting in the wings, uh, kind of fully loaded, waiting to go on and who knows what. But uh, for the most part, I'm often going to work with an extra dove or two just in case. Uh, you never know. Uh, so I'm not completely empty-handed. I've got I've got some uh, backup tricks. You know, if the if the flying bird isn't gonna uh, work tonight for whatever reason, uh, maybe I'll stick in the duff and gloves. You know, temporarily. And um, uh, you know, there there's that's why there's an MC. You know, the MC caters to the acts, hopefully. And uh, hey, I gotta be stretching out there a little bit. Uh, I'm not quite ready. That's, that's happened, uh, you know, a few times over, over lots of years, but it's, it's no big deal when it happens once, once a year, even, you know, which isn't even the case. It's frustrating for the uh, MC. Also, I was doing, a, <laughs> I was emceeing a show in uh, Bristol, England. And uh, of course the dove worker was the first one out and we were waiting for the show to begin until he was fully loaded. So I could walk out and then quickly introduce him. And I hadn't been out there, 30 seconds and they said they came out and said stretch it's like i guess a dove got loose or something happened it's like really <laughs> so it was like i don't know it, it felt like an hour but it's probably only five minutes that i had to wait and stretch before that he was actually able to uh, to come out but um have you ever had a problem where a dove has actually died uh when you produce it or during your production or it uh, doesn't roost like it should uh, i've had a bird die in a performance before you know I uh, can't say that happens often. No, uh, that's horrible when it does. I mean, not much you can do. Really, really kind of throws you for a loop in some way, psychologically, just trying to get through the rest of the set. Um, right. Well, because another thing is, of course, that the dove is more than a pet. I mean, it's something that it's, it's an assistant, a fellow assistant that you've been working with for a long time. It's like, my gosh. I mean, yeah. you got to take a moment, I would think, but the music's still playing. You got to keep going uh, with that. I, 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 I've never had one who had died that died on me, but I did have one that uh, was laying an egg. <laughs> it was funny because I, it was on the perch and they kept flying off the perch to sit on the ground. And I kept picking it up and putting it on and I was producing other doves and whatnot. And then at the end I was doing a flip over vanish and it had disappeared. And then whenever I was unloading <laughs> back in the, behind the curtain, open it up. And it's like that she just laid an egg. And so she was just looking for some place to, she was ready to pop, I guess, <laughs> at any time. I've had them pop an egg on stage. On stage? Oh, yeah. Or the From like when they're on the perch, it's like they drop a real egg. Yeah, right. <laughs> wow. All you can do is kind of shrug and say, hey, what do you do, folks? <laughs> yeah, when life gives you uh, lemons that you have a broken egg, I guess, uh, in that case. Um, and so... Why you again? When we were talking about working the Magic Island over here with with doves, why did you decide to branch out then and have the the larger parrot? Uh, just because it was uh, just so spectacular, um, you know. I started with the with the duck before before I, I yeah. I'm into the parrot. I was working with some Pekings, and uh, they were nice and cheap. <laughs> and um, yeah. you could get them in various places, you know, in a foreign country, you could, you could locate one and get one for, for some shows, a TV show or a tour. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I've used, I've used some ducks. I like the, I like the, what they call bantam or call duck. They're much smaller than a Peking. They look like a Peking, and, but they're a quarter of the size and they're very cute looking. They're, they're a little tricky to find. Um, Sort of like uh, uh, a duck that they use often in show competitions, fair hmm. competitions for poultry. They're about the size of a chicken? Uh, yeah, right. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, because I always think of a duck of just being like a mallard or something. It's a pretty big thing, you know. Yeah, well, the Pekings are mallard, considered mallards, and uh, they're, they're, they, they discharge a lot of mess. Yeah. Uh, that's a problem. Um, you've got to be constantly cleaning up and and whatnot, and have a facility for for that. And that's tricky on the road. Um, so. Well, that would lead me to you're right. Being on the road and traveling, when I have, there are 
hotels, obviously, that won't allow animals. You can't even bring a dog in unless it's a service animal or something, let alone bringing in livestock like that. Have you, do you smuggle them in or just not tell them and just check in or do you ask them beforehand? Yeah, there's, or? Been, there's been plenty of uh, sneaking men through, through my career. Uh, but we try to find places uh, that are, uh, you know, accommodate animals. Uh, what about traveling with them, like on airplanes? I assume you put them underneath. I seems like I remember hearing stories like uh, Johnny Thompson would travel with the doves already loaded you know, while he was seated. But uh, those are days gone by. You don't, you can't do that anymore. No. Uh, you know, you, you risk, one, missing your flight for sure. You know, if they find mm. doing that. Because uh, I'd done that before, Re heard the stories and, and and was doing that early on, put them on, go through the metal detectors through through security and take them out on the plane in the bathroom or whatever. And, yeah. Uh, um, they could go in the overhead compartment and uh, sometimes you would check them below as, as extra bag. I, I never really liked doing that because they were out of my possession and uh, I liked always having them with me. but. There was a period of uh, a dozen or more years where we, we were globetrotting all over, uh, putting birds up in the overhead compartment. And would they coo? Or was it because it was dark and they didn't coo? Often it's dark, so uh, it would be dark, so they would not coo. But, you know, sometimes there would be. And, uh, <laughs> you know, there's there's certainly some some smiles and mystification flight attendants that were mystified of where's that coming from and what is that? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I would think is that some of the passengers saying, are we flying so slow and are the windows so thin we can hear birds <laughs> through the well, outside? Luckily, you've got music playing as you enter the plane often and there is stuff running like AC is running. That's There is an ambient noise. Uh, so it would be difficult. You'd have to, you'd have to know, you know, almost. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and so obviously now when you're traveling, we can't do that. So you are leaving them outside your control and you have to let them be shipped underneath with the rest of the uh, luggage. Yeah. We've done, we've, or you send them through what they call cargo, how you, how you would ship illusions. Uh, you huh. show up the cargo uh, facility and fill out paperwork and I've got to supply them with the right kind of carriers. Then everything's, up to their standards and um, you know, this, those standards and, and conditions are changing every year, you know. Have you ever had a situation where that your uh, illusions or your livestock didn't show up on the other end? Yes, there's there's been on a rare occasion, missing piece of equipment, uh, stuff coming late. Um, there was there was a, a, a series of shows in, in France where the birds arrived more than one day late, and uh, unfortunately, you know, they end up docking docking the money. <laughs> oh, really? Because they were paying for that show, and that show didn't show up, so they docked you. That's right. That's huh. right. Not much you can do about that, I guess. Did you just cut your show short, or try to do something else, or? Well, I, there was, you know, the the others the others performed that day, but I didn't. I sat on the sidelines. Oh, because it was basically the bulk of your show, and so yeah, yeah I see what they're yeah. saying. Yeah, yeah. if uh, if if you were supposed to be coming in and performing doves, for an example, the doves don't show up. There's not much you could do, I guess. Yeah. Or if you're coming in to do a zigzag and that doesn't make it, it's like okay, well, <laughs> I can't perform, huh? That would be. Uh, uh, a difficult situation, uh, certainly <laughs> showing up, uh, which is the advantage, I guess, of being a mentalist in which you're just going to show up with a, a clipboard. <laughs> right. uh, or as Max Maven had said, you know, nothing. You can do a show, you know, basically and uh, go into performing however. Uh, that. Uh, so ha have you done, uh, uh, when you're doing some of your uh, illusions and also do you doing very much uh, of a talking act anymore? Or, okay. Yeah, plenty of talking. It's what helps fill the time. Uh, you can, you know, music, musical magic. It goes by so quick that it's, uh, you know, a challenge to fill up, you know, 30, 45 minutes. 
Uh, that's true. And in trying to find the right music, uh, you, you don't have problems with uh, uh, ASCAP or uh, with uh, copyrighted music whenever that you're performing someplace because they're supposed to have the license, I think, when you perform. Is that right? Often, right. I'm not playing the producer per se. Um, you should hopefully covered under the ship, um, whatever the ship is paying. The ship is, the, those cruise lines are paying those music companies somehow, you know, ASCAP. ASCAP or something. Um, Likewise, I assume in Vegas, like with the variety shows that they too right. are paying. That's right. But if you're doing just a four wall on your, on your own, you're kind of responsible for that as well. Technically you would be as a producer. Mm -hmm. uh, but maybe you can get, you can get under the venue uh, because the venue these days is um, often renting out the time slot, not just a day. You've got the venue for two hours. Hey, you're out of here. The next show's in, um, you know, shows every two hours, different shows, a lot of these venues. So the venue may have, may have something right right have you ever had well let me ask what what venue have you performed that is one of your favorites you talked about being in france and tokyo and around the world as well as in vegas and different casinos around there uh has there been a show that you've been involved with or a location that you favored one over the other well uh most of these cruise lines have state-of-the-art theaters these days unless you're working a ship that's you know 30 years old um a lot of these ships are 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 superior superior to las vegas stages but uh you know there's been some nice stages here in vegas uh uh like you said the riv here uh tropicana uh landmark landmark venues uh did one night over there lance burton uh when he was doing a charity show uh that was a fabulous venue. um so uh, winter garden in, in berlin was was a nice place to be doing shows was there any kind of uh translation issue as far as like in let's say tokyo or in germany where that you've had any language barriers so again you're doing just a non-talking act with some illusions or doves or whatever, but as far as working with the uh, tech personnel, spotlight crew and yeah, all the rest. The tech, they, they speak some English. Uh, often there's a translator. Um, so it takes a little longer in a foreign country usually. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, yeah. But it sounds like that the uh, Winter Garden was just uh, a lot of fun. Oh, it was terrific. It was yeah. terrific. Speaking of the Winter Garden, I was just thinking of uh, that in uh, Blackpool, England. Have you ever performed at Blackpool? No, I'd like to. I'd like to go there. Um, it's 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 a renowned uh, magic invention. And, yeah, and thousands and thousands, but big bigger than uh, FISM. Uh, uh, and I uh, I know that of the accolades that you have received, uh, have you uh, competed in FISM? No. Okay. No, never. Never was able to get over there, really. Okay, I didn't know, but uh, but have you attended a FISM in the past? Just as no, a magician? I'm not. No, I was hoping to uh, maybe uh, look into the one that was going to be in Quebec and Canada. Right. Uh, being in North America, I think it would be, uh, you know, the closest distance. <laughs> That's so. true. And being originally from Canada, do do you speak a little French? Oui, je parle français. <laughs> That's more than I do. I don't know what you just said, but other than yes. Yeah. Went, went, to, went to a French grade school in high school. Okay. That's kind of what I what I, I thought perhaps. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm registered for Quebec as well, whenever that's going to be. <laughs> Hopefully be able to uh, to attend that uh, maybe in next year, 22 or something. Are there, are there any updates? Not that I've heard. Uh, the, what's happened is that they have uh, actually uh, held back a little bit uh, because they wanted to have the uh, championships. There are FISM has changed a lot from the way that it used to be. I had uh, an episode uh, some time ago in talking with different people who are judges uh, on the jury to find out how that you actually move on through. I mean, right now, you, you are not just recommended or you don't have to have won just a local convention or something, and then you're put forth. You have these different um, 
uh, round robin kind of things. I mean, you have to win at certain areas and then win the next one or something uh, before that you uh, go forward. And so they have these national championships before they have the international championships. So the uh, the way to the top is, uh, has, has changed dramatically. Uh, my point being is that uh, that has been postponed and I think now until 22. So, the, uh, so, uh, uh, that way they can have those preliminaries, if you will, leading mm -hmm. up to the actual international competition, but okay. it's still planned for Quebec at this point. So, uh, that's going to be, uh, uh, coming up then soon. So anything in the, uh, in the near future that you're actually working on or that you're uh, planning to, uh, uh, to perform, I, I know that you had worked with uh, V and uh, and some other shows. Are there some uh, some things that you are looking at doing then right now? Maybe of adding some new illusions to your show or new tricks or something. Um, always working on new material. Um, um, uh, so I've been working on uh, making some changes to the to the Dove Act. Um, I'd like to try to dust off, uh, the, the, the card routine and, and get that rehearsing, but nothing, nothing on the agenda with everything shut down here still really. Yeah. Um, do you listen you know, to music all the time and try to find new bits of, uh, business and new musical pieces that can fit to your routine and yes, keep it updated? I'm making my own line, been collecting my own library for, for many years, I think as most magicians do, you know, they sure. hear, they hear something put it in the library, you know, don't know when you'll use it, but when you're looking for music, you can go to, you can go to your library and see, see what, if there's anything that's fitting. Um, mm -hmm. I'm always uh, keeping my ears out on the radio and uh, television commercials are a great source, I think, to find uh, some uh, neat music. And uh, there are various uh, royalty free uh, website places um and um you know it's not like it used to be going into the the record store and uh, you were lucky to be you know testing out the vinyl or right. testing, out, testing out the cd you know <laughs> i don't think many people understand first of all what we're talking about when we talk about vinyl or even cds <laughs> nowadays of the generation but uh, and, and even further back as you said that you could actually go in and say can i listen to this first before i purchase it that's right and they'll take it out of the sleeve yeah. and spin it and uh let and go into a little studio with headphones and you could actually listen to the album before you bought it right i remember going into the music store in los angeles and uh spend you know maybe maybe a couple hours there on on a headset trying to trying to find something find find stuff you know when i bought a sub trunk i spent I think two, maybe three years before I first performed it. And it wasn't just from uh, rehearsal because I had rehearsed it, but I couldn't find the right routine and the right music that seemed to work and drive the story that I was wanting to, to tell or to do with that. And it took a long time, but it's one of those things that when you hear it and it hits you, it's like, that's it. And who knows, that inspiration could come, as you say, listening to the radio, uh, just in passing somewhere. You might be on the elevators thinking, wait a minute, what is this playing? This is a familiar tune or well, whatever. Movie, movies and TV shows these days. These TV shows are like like movies. They're like short films. So they're constantly using soundtracks. They're a wonderful uh, resource for finding music, too. That's a very good point. Uh, certainly with the soundtracks from uh, different music or other different films that can set the right tone, whether you want it to uh, be exciting or kind of uh, a little bit more mellow or romantic or whatever it is, that a lot of times people don't listen to the music in the background. I, I recently had attended the uh, Houston Symphony's uh, production of uh, Star Wars. And so they were playing that on the big screen and then the symphony was playing the music under that. So mm -hmm. it was just the soundtrack of the, uh, of the voice and, and the movie that we were seeing, the film, and all of the music from the soundtrack had been stripped away, so it had been done live. But before they began is that the conductor was saying, I want you to remember that we're actually doing this live because you're going to get so wrapped up in the movie, you'll forget we're actually down here with the violins and the horns and everything else. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's that kind of a thing that a lot of times you don't listen to the music, and I think that we should, particularly if you're trying to find some some the right music for your act or for a routine or whatever it is 
uh, to to listen to the underlying themes uh, as you're watching a film, not just because the music's what really helps drive the the content of of the film. Right. So just one of those things I think to listen to. Well, listen, I appreciate your time. It's just really kind of zipped by over here. I, I wanted to ask you uh, last question then also, Jason, that I've got a, uh, the name of the podcast is called the Magic Word Podcast. And I always like to close by asking my guests what it is that is their magic word or phrase. What is it that is something that you live by? What's important to you? What is it that uh, uh, drives you, I guess? I got I got this phrase from my friend Scott Rawlings uh, ages and ages ago when he had me under his wing, and uh, it's, uh, the the catchphrase is "May the magic be with you." May the magic be with you. <laughs> you sound like Obi Wan. May the force be with you. <laughs> <laughs> very wise words. Uh, thank you very much, Jason. That's been great. I appreciate you being a guest here on this week's episode. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. You bet. It's over the Magic Word Podcast. That was Jason Byrne, and this is Scotty Out. I want to thank my guest, Mr. Jason Byrne, for being on the podcast episode here this week. Thank you very much for your time and for joining us there from Las Vegas. And I also want to thank each of you for being a viewer. I started to say a listener, but you're not only listening, but you're watching because we're doing this over here on YouTube. And I hope if you enjoy this, you should subscribe to the channel. Uh, that is just hit the subscribe button uh, here below in this video. So that way you can be up to date whenever we do have something that is being released by the Magic Word podcast or other things that we're doing on this channel. A lot of things have been happening here recently. So I want to thank all of you guys who have subscribed. And for those of you who haven't, please do. What's stopping you? Now's the time to do it. Also, I suggest, if you will, please go to themagicwordpodcast.com. And with that, you see, you will be able then to see a pop-up window that should come over there where you can subscribe to the pod letter. We are looking to try to get uh, uh, reach as many of you as we can to let you know about our upcoming episodes who we're going to be releasing on the day the episode goes live, and also just other contests that you'll be the first to know whenever we have something free that we're going to be giving away. And we have been giving away thousands of dollars worth of stuff over the years. And uh, there have been a lot of winners, and it's been a lot of fun, and we appreciate everyone who has donated everything then, too. And again, all you need to do is go over there to themagicwordpodcast.com, and you can then see a link where you can subscribe, and uh, please do. And listen regularly please tell others about this podcast and if you have a few moments please go and leave a five-star rating and some nice comment if you will so this way it helps our podcast to grow and lets other people know about it as well and as I said if you can let people know just in your club if you are someone who writes the club newsletter and uh, if you'll just kind of include the logo you can go to the magic podcast.com there you can click on that uh, graphic up above and you will be able to download that keep it put it in your newsletter send it out let other people know about this and you can share the love with everybody or I should say share the word spread the, the word the magic word <laughs> podcast and let others know about uh, what's going on then too a lot of really uh, cool stuff we still have yet coming up over the uh, coming weeks I have several that are already in the can so to speak so they are ready to go and we're going to be releasing those and those will be talked about in the pod letter so again if you haven't subscribed please do lots of cool stuff and so, until next week, stay well, get booked, and may the magic be with you. <laughs> this is Scotty out. <laughs>